The Peter Schiff Show. Today was a day of damage control for the Federal Reserve. You know, it almost seems like whenever they discuss the possibility of a rate hike, they're really launching a trial balloon because they want to gauge the market's reaction to the possibility of a rate hike. And then I guess if the market kind of shrugs it off or blesses the rate hike the way it did last year, nearing December, if the market seems like it's okay with a rate hike, then maybe they'd consider actually implementing one. But before they do it, They want to test the waters. They want to see how the market reacts to that possibility. Now, clearly, the near 400-point decline in the Dow on Friday showed that the market really wasn't very friendly to the possibility of a rate hike, let alone uh, the certainty of one, just the mere possibility. However remote that possibility may be, really spooked the market. So today, the Federal Reserve had a chance to dial it back. They had three Fed presidents speaking today, and not a one of them talked about the possibility of a rate hike, starting with an 8 a.m. talk this morning by Atlanta Federal Reserve President Dennis Lockhart. Now, Dennis was actually specifically asked about a rate hike and whether he thought, you know, the Fed would move in September, November, December. And he specifically refused to comment. He said, and I'm quoting, financial markets seem to be very sensitive to the remarks of Fed speakers at the moment. And so as a result of market sensitivity, he refused to answer the question. Well, well, why not answer it? I mean, don't you want to prepare the markets for a possible rate hike? If you think you're going to raise rates, why not say it? Well, we don't want to say it because we don't like the way the market is reacting. You better believe If the markets reacted favorably to the possibility of a rate hike, they would have stayed on script. But because of the big sell-off on Friday, and of course where the futures opened up, before Lockhart spoke, the Dow was set to open up down 100 points or more. But once he spoke, all of a sudden people were thinking, hey, wait a minute, he didn't say anything about the possibility of a rate hike, and he's worried about the market's sensitivity, the market reaction. The only thing he said, which made some people think maybe he's thinking rate hike, is he said that the data over the past few weeks warrants serious discussion of a policy rate increase. Now, the data over the past few weeks has all been bad. So all he said is it warrants discussion of a policy rate increase. But he didn't say that we should be in favor of an increase or against an increase. He just said the data over the past few weeks warrants a discussion. Well, to me, what that means is we should discuss not raising rates because all the data that we've gotten recently is weak. It was the data that we got a couple of months ago that supposedly let Janet Yellen conclude that the case for a rate hike had strengthened. But really, what Lockhart is saying is, We need to have a serious discussion about a rate increase. Not that we have to discuss raising interest rates, but maybe we should discuss not raising interest rates. Because if it's based on the data from just the past few weeks, you would be arguing against an increase. right? If he just said we need to discuss an increase, he wouldn't have predicated it with the data over the past few weeks. Because that data in and of itself is not friendly to an increase. If you just think we should increase rates, you wouldn't qualify it with the data of the past few weeks. But also, just saying that we're going to have a discussion of a policy rate increase, even if you're discussing increasing it, that's not the same thing as actually increasing it. You see, a discussion to increase rates could lead to no rate hike. It just means that you discussed it, you considered it, You weighed all the possibilities, but it doesn't mean that at the end of the day, you're going to actually do it. So he didn't say that based on the data, we should hike rates. He just said, based on the data, we should have a discussion. 
about raising rates? Well, I'm assuming they've been having discussions about raising rates for the last several years. I mean, what else do they discuss over there? There's not much else the Federal Reserve does. So I'm sure they always discuss raising rates, and I'm sure they're always supposedly serious discussions, yet those discussions have only yielded one rate hike, and that was in December of last year, and so that's it. But I think people still heard the word discussion, rate hike in the same sentence. And so the markets weren't that excited until we got another discussion at about one o'clock. But the markets had gone positive. I think they rallied back. They liked the fact that at least Lockhart was worried about the markets and decided not to comment on whether or not there was going to be a rate hike. Because, again, I still don't even think that they were planning a September rate hike. They just want to keep the possibility alive. And in fact, the Fed governors do discuss the idea that they don't want to create an asset bubble, which, of course, you know, talk about closing the barn door after the horses have left. If they were concerned about asset bubbles, they never would have launched QE1. And in fact, the irony of it is they launched quantitative easing specifically to get asset prices to go up. So the goal was to inflate a bubble. And now they're saying they don't want to do one. Well, they've already got one. But I'm thinking that maybe what the Federal Reserve wants to do is they don't want to raise interest rates. They know they have to keep them low indefinitely. They know they're going to do more QE. But they don't want to say that because if they actually tell the markets, hey, this is QE infinity, we're never raising rates, they know the markets are going to take off. And they may not want that. They may think, We don't want a bubble, even though we've already got one. Maybe they think that what we have now is not a bubble, but they're afraid that we might get a bubble if the markets honestly believe that there's never going to be a rate hike. So what their strategy is to keep the markets in check is to keep talking about the possibility of a rate hike so the markets never really get the message that they got nothing to worry about. That, you know, it's this is the forward guidance. It's it's getting the markets to believe that a rate hike is around the corner, and that will put a damper on the animal spirits of the traders. They're on their toes. They're guarded. You see, when they knew for a while that the Fed wasn't going to raise rates for a long time and it was going to be easy money, then the markets were going up. The only thing that stopped the markets from going up these past year or two uh, is the idea that the party's ending, that the Fed's going to take away the punch bowl. We don't know sure exactly when, But, you know, we started with the taper or started with the taper talk, then the actual taper. And then we had one rate hike. But the Fed doesn't want to actually deliver all these rate hikes. It doesn't want to actually shrink its balance sheet because then it will collapse this phony economy that it works so hard to prop up. But it doesn't want the markets to know that because it doesn't want the bubble to get bigger. So what does it do? It keeps interest rates low so it can prop up the phony economy but keeps talking about raising them so that the stock market doesn't go out of hand, right? Because they they don't want the bubble to get even bigger. But the minute they start talking about raising rates, it's not about just the stock market not going up. It starts to go down. And that's something they really are afraid of. More so than creating a bigger bubble, what really scares them is the air coming out of the bubble we already have. And so when they saw the reaction On Friday, I'm sure these guys got together and they said, "Okay, you know, we're all talking on uh, Monday. So here's a new script. Forget about talking about rate hike possibilities and start talking about why we got to keep rates low. And that's what happened at one o'clock. We got a couple of people that spoke. We got Minneapolis Federal Reserve President Neil Kashkari. He spoke. But the more highly anticipated speech was from Federal Reserve Governor Lyle Brainerd, who apparently is one of the bigger doves on the FOMC. And so everybody was wondering, okay, if she starts talking about rate hikes, the possibility of rate hikes, they must really be considering it. Because after all, I mean, this is Uber Dove. And and so if they've got her on board, well, then we really need to be worried. But of course, when she spoke, she didn't mention at one point, really, the possibility of a rate hike. All she did is talk about why the Fed should not hike, why the Fed needs to go slow, why we need to err on the side of uh, keeping rates too low, not uh, making them too high, that we don't have to move preemptively 
uh, against inflation, that the Fed has to be more concerned that we don't have enough inflation, that growth is still not fast enough, that the labor markets are still not strong enough. So her entire speech was why the Fed should not raise rates. Clearly, somebody who gave a speech like Brainer just gave is not about to vote to raise interest rates next week. And of course, since these decisions are almost always unanimous. I mean, once in a while you get one person that dis, you know dissents. But given how far away she is from believing that there's going to be a rate hike, you, you, you'd have to completely disregard the possibility that the Fed is about to hike rates next week. In fact, everything that I heard today basically confirmed what I already knew, that the Federal Reserve had no intention of raising interest rates in September. In fact, they probably have no intention of raising them in December either. But right now, the markets are more concerned with September and the probability there. And that just took a dive based on what these three guys or, or, and gal had to say today. But you think this is a coincidence? You have several Fed officials that talk about the possibility of a rate hike. The market tanks. And then the next day, they all come out, and no one talks about the possibility of a rate hike. Everybody is now dovish. They've gone from supposedly being hawkish to being dovish in one day. And what's changed between those days? The market dropped sharply on a Friday. And as I said when I did my podcast last week, if these guys had all come out and talked about a rate hike coming in September, we would have been down big today. We might have been down another four or 500 points. Maybe we've been down 1,000. Remember I said it's a giant game of chicken, right? The, the Fed comes out and talks about a rate hike, and then the markets tank, and then at some point they got a reverse. Well, they called chicken already. Just one 400-point drop. That's it. That's all the heat they could take. They didn't even want to wait for a 10% correction. They were they, they, One day down was it. That was all it took. And all of a sudden, everybody is out there with a whole new script. Hey, Rate hikes out the way. We're going to talk about being easy. We're going to talk about not raising rates. Forget about all that, you know, rate hikes and, you know, rate, rate hikes, uh, the case for rate hikes are stronger or, you know, the, the markets are getting ready for a hike. No, everything was about why we need to stay on hold, why we need to go slow. This is not an accident. They are responding. In fact, you got the Fed governor, the, I mentioned this morning, he said, well, the markets are very sensitive to what we say. Well, they've always been sensitive. They know that. That's why they said it. You don't think when these uh, FOMC guys make a comment about rates, you don't think they know that the markets are going to react? They're gauging it, right? That's their trial balloon. I said it's a litmus test. They're specifically looking for the reaction because they want to know that the markets are okay with a rate hike. They don't even want to raise rates unless they think they can do it without hurting the markets. And so they launch the trial balloons and then they find out. And when they find out, they back away. But again, too, it's not just the market that can't take higher rates. It's the bubble economy. You think the housing market can handle higher rates? Of course not. You think overly indebted consumers that are living on credit card debt, you know, you think they can handle it? You think people that have adjustable rate mortgages, you think they can handle a increase in their mortgage payment? They can barely handle the payments they got now. And of course, the biggest adjustable rate borrower of them all is the federal government itself. You think the federal government can afford to pay more interest on the national debt? We can't even afford to pay the interest on the national debt now, even though it's so low, because we have to borrow the money to do that. But we can't borrow even more if the Federal Reserve raises interest rates. So there's all sorts of reasons that they don't want to raise rates. But obviously, you know, the biggest consequence of a rate hike initially is how the markets respond. And with Donald Trump rising in the polls, you think they want that, especially with what happened over the weekend with Hillary Clinton and, you know, her collapsing uh, at the September 11th memorial service? You know, this this is going to increase Donald Trump's chances now that all of a sudden the uh, Hillary health question is no longer just some kind of white ring extremist conspiracy that we have all this evidence out there that there is something wrong with Hillary Clinton's health. And of course, they're lying about it and they're covering up about it because initially when she was collapsing as they were rushing her into that car that was caught on film, they were claiming that it was, you know, heat stroke, even though it was not even that hot of a day. It was maybe in the upper 70s. Uh, maybe it got to low 80s, but it wasn't very humid. The humidity collapsed way down. It was a beautiful day. 
uh, the day that she supposedly, you know, had heat exhaustion. But and then they brought her out later in the day. She she went back up to Chelsea's apartment and she came back down. They caught her on film and, and, and she said, oh, I feel great. I feel great. And then today they come out and say, oh, she's got pneumonia. I mean, she's got pneumonia. I mean, what is it? Was it was it the heat or was it pneumonia? And if it was pneumonia, why did they say she had pneumonia originally? And if she had pneumonia, why would she tell everybody she was feeling great? I mean, I'm going to imagine if you have pneumonia, you don't feel so great. And if she had pneumonia, why didn't the doctor tell her, hey, you got to stay in bed for a few days. You can't go to this fundraiser. You can't go to this 9-11 service. You got to get, you know, you got to stay in bed. You got this pneumonia. To me, it looks like they keep changing their story. They keep making stuff up. You know, I, I was reading this article about, you know, asking, you know, why, you know, why is, would she be lying about her health? And my thinking was, well, she lies about everything else. Why should her health be any different? I mean, that's the natural reaction of Clinton is to lie about something. I mean, why tell the truth when a lie sounds so much better? So that's what they're always trying to do. It's all spin. It's all try how to try to create the best possible scenario. Now, I don't know what she might have uh, and, and, and whether she's got some kind of a permanent thing. You go on the internet, you read all this stuff about, oh, maybe she's got Parkinson's disease. I don't know what she's got. But to me, it looks like she's got something that they're covering up. And it seems like it's getting out. And the fact that it's getting out obviously is going to weaken her credibility and it's going to help Trump. And maybe that's why Trump now is he doesn't have to say much. He can just sit back and allow Hillary to self-destruct and allow more and more people to be nervous. That's why, you know, when they asked uh, Donald Trump about Hillary's health. He didn't you know, he didn't allege anything about it. He just said, well, I hope she feels better. Hope she gets better. Looking forward to see her on the, on the campaign trail. He didn't start playing into any of the fears or the conspiracy theories that, you know, she's hiding something. All he did is, I wish her well. I hope she gets better. And, and so I think that means that he knows at this point that, you know, this he just can coast in here now because things are going to go downhill for Hillary Clinton very rapidly as more people start putting two and two together. Although Donald Trump did say some interesting things today on, on CNBC, very, very accurate things about the Fed and about Janet Yellen and about the political pressure that's been put on her by the Obama administration to keep interest rates down and how we have a phony economy and how we have a phony market and how eventually rates are going to go up and is the market's going to tank and it's going to be a big problem. All that stuff was dead on. And he said that Janet Yellen ought to be ashamed of herself. And she should. I mean, I've called they're all traitors. All these guys are monitored traitors or committing treason, as far as I'm concerned. That's what uh, Rick Perry said. Remember when he talked about Ben Bernanke? You know, he said he was treason, you know, to print all this money, all this quantitative easing. It is. These are acts uh, against the United States that are working to undermine the U.S. economy. And the comments that he made were accurate. You know, and he also clarified, I think, without specifically addressing it, because one of the one of the criticisms that I had about Trump, I pointed out, was that Donald Trump said, hey, I like low interest rates. I'm a low interest rate guy, as if, you know, he was blessing the artificial low interest rates. Well, he clarified that. He said, as a real estate investor, he said, I love low interest rates, which is true. He's making a lot of money. These low interest rates help you if you're a real estate investor, and they help you if you're a debtor. And we all know that, you know, Donald Trump is the king of debt, right? He proclaims himself the king of debt. Well, inflation benefits debtors. I mean, inflation is really a transfer of wealth from creditors to debtors. The biggest debtors in the world are governments, particularly the U.S. government. So the U.S. government benefits dramatically by creating inflation. But there are other debtors that benefit. They, they get a ride on the government's coattails. People like Donald Trump, who borrow a lot of money to buy real estate, develop real estate. They're also debtors. If they get to screw their creditors by paying them off with debased money, they win. If they get to borrow money at negative interest rates, meaning the cost of borrowing is lower than the annual cost of monetary depreciation, or you got negative rates, that's a dream come true for a real estate investor. So Donald Trump said, as a real estate investor, I love low interest rates. But he said, but for the country, it's a different thing because if there's a winner, there's a loser, right? That's what happens. It's a transfer of wealth. So when Donald Trump, as a debtor, is benefiting from low interest rates and inflation, there's the other side of the coin that's losing. There's the creditors that are getting screwed. And Donald Trump understands that this policy may be good for certain people, certain factions or special interests, but overall, for the country, it's bad. 
and that he knows something bad is coming because eventually interest rates are going to go up, whether the Federal Reserve wants it to happen or not. Eventually, they're going to lose control. They always do. In the long run, the markets always win. And the markets are going to wake up and interest rates are going to go way up. And it's a huge problem. Donald Trump knows that there's a huge problem coming. What he's going to do about it, that we don't know. Remember, initially he talked about defaulting or restructuring. And then he backtracked out of that when somebody pointed out that what he said, which, of course, is our only real viable option. And then he immediately changed his tune and said, no, we'll just print a bunch of money. But that's exactly what we're doing now. And if we do that, we're only going to make the situation worse. But the most important thing is he was out there on television, on CNBC, and it got picked up at other reporters really calling out the Fed, talking about the phony nature of this recovery, the artificial level of the markets and how it's all being propped up by the Fed. And the Fed proved it today because what did they do? Damage control. They went out. They couldn't stand. They knew that there was a big chance of a big drop this Monday. They saw that big drop on Friday, and they said, "Uh uh-oh, we got to do something. We got to make sure that our people are out there giving speeches because we know the market is listening, and they didn't like what they heard on Friday. Let's make sure that we say something different. And that's why you had the big rally in the Dow. You had the NASDAQ up 85 points today. Now, it wasn't 125 or 130 points that it lost, but it recovered a big chunk chunk of those losses. The transport's up 100 points. Look at the utilities. Utilities up, uh, again, not as much as they were down. The Dow Jones itself was up about 240 points. So again, not quite, you know, maybe about 60% of what it lost on the Friday. But believe me, if those Fed officials had been the same on Monday as they were Friday, if they were all talking about how a rate hike is possible in September, it, might, it, it would have been 230 points in the other direction and, and maybe more. Of course, gold stocks also had decent recovery. Again, about 50% of what they lost. They were down a little over 5% on Friday, so they were up about 2.5%. Although I did see some individual stocks that recoup pretty much all of what they lost. But in general, it was about a 50% recovery. The price of gold didn't do very much today. It was about unchanged. But remember, gold was only down about 10 bucks on on friday so gold didn't go down very much relative to the big decline we saw in in gold stocks so it really didn't have much ground to recover and the dollar index you know it actually lost back a little ground but again it wasn't up that much on friday surprisingly enough it was only up a little bit and then it was gave gave back most of those gains today but the dollar was stronger this morning before we had all these fed comments these dovish comments and again This is all by design. So I would expect uh, the rhetoric to change for a while because they don't want the markets preparing for a September rate hike because they don't like the way the markets reacted to the possibility. Just imagine how they would react to the actual hike. If they were that nervous about the mere possibility of a hike, imagine what would happen if the Fed actually delivered a hike. And with the election coming up, with Hillary slipping in the polls as as her health issues are are becoming a serious issue and not just a conspiratorial, uh, you know, let's, you know, non-event because, oh, you know, this is all some right-wing conspiracy. All of a sudden, it's real news and it's a real problem. The last thing, the last thing that the Fed wants to do is compound the problems for Hillary by raising interest rates, tanking the stock market, and than giving uh, Donald Trump an even bigger push up in, in the polls. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? 
If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now, I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.